Good day and welcome to another episode of our discussion on the Horn of Africa TV. Today we will focus on Southern Sudan, another uh, country in the Horn of Africa. And with me as always is my good friend and comrade, Professor Mohammed Hassan. Hello, Salan, yeah, Professor Marhabik. Hello, Salan, comrade Elias Amara. How are you today? I am okay, uh, comrade Elias. Good, good to see you as always. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce comrade Elias Amara to the public that it is the board of Horn, the new Horn of Africa Television have decided uh, that it is comrade uh, Elias Amara will be the vice president of the board. Uh, uh, I congratulate you, you are welcome. We need people like uh, Comrade Amara uh, who have a wider vision and experience in the media. Uh, we appreciate that he's one of the most important pillars of the Horn of Africa uh, uh, TV. And uh, in the future, uh, we would like to uh, increase the number of members of uh, the Horn of Africa TV from the different Horn of African countries, probably will bring also uh, eloquent uh, uh, journalist uh, and uh, a far-sighted man from Somalia, Djibouti, and also Ethiopians, uh, Kenyans. Uh, maybe I will be traveling uh, soon to you know, Kenya and Ethiopia. Uh, I will discuss with Ethiopians and Kenyans uh, which I knew some journalists there who are eloquent in understanding the whole of Africa to join us. And uh, above all, I really thank Comrade Elias Amara for his knowledge and contribution for the whole of Africa. Thank you very much, Comrade Elias Amara. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Comrade Professor Mohammed Hassan and uh, all the good friends uh, on the Horn of Africa TV board. It's quite an honor and a privilege uh, for me to join you on board. And um, I hope uh, I will uh, contribute uh, towards the greater uh, vision of uh, Horn of Africa peace and stability and democracy. Thank you again. Uh, with uh, that and your kind words of introduction, uh, let us proceed then to the focus of our discussion today, which will be on Southern Sudan. Uh, Southern Sudan has been independent since uh, 2011, it became independent uh, in 2011. Uh, and so it is the newest uh, and youngest nation in the Horn of Africa that uh, honor used to go to us in Eritrea, but now South Sudan is uh, the youngest nation in, in uh, Africa, the 54th uh, nation that is. So uh, I will uh, let you say a few words uh, by way of introduction to Southern Sudan and uh, what is happening uh, there. Bring us up to speed from, uh, from before independence of Sudan 1956 uh, up to now. Thank you, Comrade Elias. Uh, uh, the people of Southern Sudan uh, in, in specific, and the people of Sudan in general, uh, have suffered a lot of war, conflict, uh, dislocation of the population, refugees, and so on. I remember when I was a young man in Addis Ababa, uh, in teenage uh, stage, I had a friend from South Sudanese who have been refugees in Ethiopia in the time of Anya movement. And I used to discuss with him. I think he is a Dinka man. Uh, his name was John. Very kind person because uh, we come into contact partially because of my knowledge of Arabic. And I liked the, his English pronunciation, and he spoke very good English. I used to bring him home, and uh, I remember one of the advice my father gave me. He says, Muhammad, you should bring him frequently. He is like your brother. 
these people have suffered for a very long time a war, unnecessary war. They should have been uh, in peace and uh, they should have lived in their country. Uh, and he says he has visited uh, uh, their country from Kumruk, from Gondar area, down into the south. And he had a very extensive relationship also with the Bani Shumpul people. So this made me aware of what uh, my first uh, awareness about Sudan, apart from the cultural, uh, the music and so on, Sudan with uh, the famous Sudanese artists who had influenced uh, the younger generation, those who are my generation and beyond. Uh, South Sudanese, they were in thousands, uh, young people, refugees, and allocated into different schools in Ethiopia. Of course, uh, uh, I didn't concentrate deep the composition of South Sudan, and uh, my consciousness was not uh, big enough uh, uh, to understand the complicated and the historical conflict uh, among the Sudanese, which happened since 1957, the six they had independence, 57 the Anya movement established, uh, started. Therefore, this center periphery contradiction between the center and the south had continued for a very long time. And this have created a big economic and social problem for the whole Sudan, first of all, and specific for Southern Sudan. But my reading of Southern Sudan is Southern Sudan is exactly like the Northern Sudan, as the Sudan is crafted by external forces, growth, different type of people in Southern Sudan who have different type of mode of production. One of them is the pastoralist, uh, uh, which is the Denka, uh, the Nuer, and also these are pastoralist cow people uh, moving from one place to another place. And the most important thing for them is the market of life stock. Not all, and they extend until, until the uh, Congo or DRC today, and also Kenya. Uh, the Morele of Kenya also, they live part in southern Sudan and part of uh, in, 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 in Kenya. The war has destroyed four fundamental uh, uh, basis of the South Sudanese society to survive. Civil war brought dislocation of the cattle market, which is the pastoralist communities they were dependent on. It. And because of uh, the civil war and the security situation, which is the civil war which started in 1957 with the Southern demand and the Anya movement, and this gradually destroyed the markets that the communication the market which had been uh, the merging, uh, gradually growing and creating uh, the basis of the nation in the south or in the Sudan in general, it had been destroyed through the uh, war. And the youth have been recruited into the war and uh, the relationship between the pastoralists and the, the subsistence farmers also was destroyed that it is, there is no, in fact, you could say civilization. The young people were recruited, refugees, the raping, the stealing of the children, and so on and so on. The agony of the South Sudanese people, it is, I think, after Eritrea, it is the only place that it is, uh, the people have suffered seriously, and they became refugees in the neighboring countries. And there was no uh, such a very big appeal in the imperialist country for the Southern Sudanese to take them or to settle them in the imperialist countries, whether the United States and Europe, as they did to the Somalis, which happened in 1990. That by itself intrigued me. Uh, the destruction of the livestock market in southern Sudan brought a disaster, even though they have a lot of livestock. The second is the dislocation of uh, of the peasantry, of subsistence peasant and the pastoralist people. Well, a lot of young people have been joined in the army, banditism, at the same time fighting, recruited sometimes by force, by the regime in Khartoum and so on. The disaster and the dislocation sociologically with the change of the society, not in the positive sense, but in 
in a negative sense it happened as any war in the world, wherever it is, brings a disaster to the people of South Arab Sudan. Uh, this has to be considered also one of the major problems Southern Sudanese are facing today, that it is the rehabilitation of the youth, uh, reintegrating the youth as in a new society with a new vision, with a new culture. Uh, in the process also, uh, uh, delinquent culture have developed in the South. Uh, militarism, the thinking of militarism have developed. The antagonism between the pastoralist and uh, the peasantry or subsistence peasantry, the Bantu tribes, also increased sometimes, even though we don't hear a lot of that, we hear more the most aggressive ones, also the pastoralists, whether the New Year and the Dinka or the, the Murele and so on, who are fighting sometimes because of the nature uh, uh, of their production system, force them to defend and to fight or to loot the cattle of the other side. So Sudan, Southern Sudan, after independence, is facing a serious, a serious economic dislocation. Uh, in this uh, uh, part of Southern Sudan, uh, one positive element uh, uh, have developed in the history of Southern Sudan after uh, Numeri uh, uh, Agreement in 1972 in Addis Ababa, the peace agreement, and uh, through that peace agreement, self-rule to the South, until 1985, he instituted Sharia. There is certain development have developed, and the society was getting peaceful and integrating gradually. Students are coming back to study, refugees are uh, coming back, and there was some certain type of movement have developed, uh, 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 which is means uh, uh, then suddenly the discovery of the oil by itself brought and became a curse to the South Sudanese and the Sudanese themselves. And it's because of lack of uh, a vision, of a nation-building vision in both Sudan, particularly those who are responsible in the center, uh, the vision of building a greater Sudan, as the Sudan is as great as a multinational, multicultural, multi-religious society. But it is the use, the sectarian element and sectarian ideologies in order to sit at the top and loot the resources of the nation. And this again ignited the second movement. And this, the second movement also continued for a very long time. The difference is between the first and the second movement in the South. The second movement was uh, led by a general who had been a general in the Sudanese army, the late General Garam. Garam is not an only a military man. Uh, yes, he he is a soldier, he is a member of the Sudanese army, he reaches to the level of a general, but at the same time he is a reader who also understands the society, he understands also the mechanism of politics and transforming societies to a higher stage. And this general have developed an idea which calls the new Sudan, a Sudan al Jadid which is means that it is he accepted Sudan is a multicultural, multi-religious, and a multi-ethnic. Yes, it is. It's a blessing. The diversity by itself is not the problem. It is accommodating the diversity and building a vision of a new Sudan on the new basis and build a new nation and, and unity with diversity. This idea uh, uh, of him uh, was not liked by three layers uh, uh, of enemies of him, one within the Sudan itself, within Southern Sudan, who are using the cover of Southern Sudan, but they want to, if Sudan, Southern Sudan gets independence, a very narrow nationalist Southern Sudanese in cover, but clannish, whether they are Wulumbe you Estele, know, the Dinka domination, those, the pretty bourgeoisie from that community wanted to dominate the state after independence and in fact to loot southern Sudan. And that's why after independence also the contradiction between two pastoralist communities, the Nuer and the Dinka, and it brought a civil war with, uh, 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 between the two communities and brought uh, the other communities, they were not involved within the civil war. 
these two pastoralists who are competing for hegemony of the state that they caused again a civil war in the country. Particularly those who suffered also is the uh, the subsistence farmers, the Bantu. You know, in the south you have the Melotic population, and and then there is also the Islamic community in the north, within the south, uh, and you have also the Bantu tribes who are uh, farmers or subsistence farmers. This Pele in uh, most of it is uh, history is dominated by the Dinka. And this is always uh, the Nalgaran complaint about saying that the Southern Despelem, it is supposed to be a multinational movement. We try to unify as much as possible people to join with us. Sometimes at the top is very, very easy. But on the ground, those who are combatants to increase the number, which represents the South Sudanese, we didn't succeed, he said. We tried all our best but it is within succeed. The consciousness and the level of the consciousness is not so high and it needs a very high, uh, uh, hard work to raise the consciousness of the masses, to give them the sense that it is they belong to this country, they have the right to live in this country and they have to fight and struggle together and build a new Sudan. On that, it is he himself said, uh, the late General Garan, we didn't succeed. And it is little bit, it is the militarism which became stronger than the ideological mobilization of the society. But apart from that, General Garan also became the center by igniting a new renaissance within the Sudan, the greater Sudan, in order to influence most of the Sudanese, whether they are from the north or the south, to come under one umbrella and to forge a sort of a united front with a new vision to replace the Islamists in Sudan who are dividing the Sudan and bring a new hope. Unfortunately, he didn't succeed. In his late uh, uh, conference of his own party, the SPLA, that it is the narrow nationalists who had been inside of his party, particularly those, the Dinka element, who wanted uh, 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 secession automatically and no relationship with the North, they were defeated in the discussion and finally they were burgeoned from the party because General Graham says that these are a virus, they have no vision, Southern Sudan cannot be stable, they are an egoist who wanted to rule Sudan. And that was proven by him. After the Nafasha agreement, then one of the agreement uh, 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 concept is uh, resource sharing. They have shared the resource, particularly the oil resource, and the Norse have deposited to the South account $2.5 billion er, er, and so on. And that money was not used for the people. It was embezzled and, and, and it was stolen. They didn't even put one pipeline of food, clean water for one family in Southern Sudan. So one has also a new ruling class or uh, warlord type element. They have no vision of uh, a new society and building and using the energy of the nation and the people to establish a new community. Nobody is an enemy of anybody in Sudan or in northern Sudan. All of them, they are a victim, a population who have been victimized and harassed and exploited, but unfortunately they didn't have, like my country, a leadership who can unify, bring a new vision, and, and bring all the population and the youth in one line in order to defeat the internal enemy and external enemy and build a new uh, nation or building the start, uh, putting the stone or to build a nation building. That it didn't happen. I congratulate the South Sudanese now last week, they have signed an agreement in Juba that they will resolve their own problem. But there are also other sponsors who are not interested in the peace of Southern Sudan, who are on the table and they might be the sponsors of this meeting. But the main objective of external forces, which I see are two types. One of them is that who wanted to have a land grabbing and to have a very big plantation for their own development and, and to produce agriculture, particularly rice in Southern Sudan because of the fertility of the ground, the accessibility of, of, of the water, 
uh, at the same time they wanted to build a range of livestock which will, will, will South Sudan had also a huge number of livestock and so and so on. I appeal to the people of Southern Sudan and the government investment is not bad, but they have to be very careful how to deal with this investment. And this investment must be in the interest of Southern Sudanese people before anybody else. And they have to analyze. Otherwise, this kind of investment, they might again bring also contradiction like, and it can be the wealth of the nation a curse against the nation. Uh, General Graham, uh, maybe through his experience, through his multicultural behavior he had, he spoke very good Arabic, he spoke English, he had a, a good knowledge of the North and the South. He had been a general in the army and he was uh, dealing with Sudanese from all types of the region of Sudan. He understood the Sudanese psychology and so on. Therefore, uh, he was a great man. Uh, unfortunately, he was killed. And for Southern Sudan, it was a very bad time. Yeah, if I may uh, uh, add to some of the salient points you've been raising on the, the current the crisis in South Sudan. Historically, as you said, uh, the, the British uh, separately uh, administered South Sudan. They kind of quarantined it or cordoned it off from the north um, and kept it really in severe underdevelopment uh, when you compare it to the north. Uh, capitalist development didn't uh, take off there as much as it did in the north. Uh, the, can, the, the, re the region South Sudan was not interconnected by roads. All other services were uh, almost non-existent there. So that uh, imbalance was there from, from the very beginning. Uh, this does mean, however, that uh, the relationship between the North and the South only started with uh, the coming of imperialism, the British rule since 1898. Uh, actually, before uh, the advent of colonialism to Africa, in what is now Sudan, uh, there were several kingdoms. Uh, the greatest of them was uh, in medieval times, the, full, the Funj Sultanate uh, with its base in Sanar. And historians say that uh, the beginnings of that Funj Sultanate, uh, the Sanar uh, Sultanate, was from uh, the Shiluk Kingdom expanding northwards. Uh, Shiluk are uh, in South Sudan now, in, in, uh, with the center in Fashoda. So uh, the, the Fuji Sultanate was sort of a syncretic between the Nubian Arabized uh, tribes and uh, Southern Shiluk coming together and uh, it became a, quite a, a big uh, kingdom, formidable kingdom uh, from the beginning of uh, the 16th century. It lasted up to uh, late 18th century. Uh, it fought against the Ottoman uh, expansion uh, and uh, defeated them. It also, uh, at various times, fought against the Abyssinian kingdom with its center in uh, Gondor. Uh, the kings, uh, the, the Abyssinian Ethiopian king, like Susenius, had fought there. But it was quite a, you know, a big uh, empire. I mean, a, a big kingdom. At one time, it ruled up to what is now Eritrea, the Western Gashbarka region of Eritrea. So uh, there was this, uh, this relationship. Uh, of course, Funj Sultanate raided uh, the South for slaves, uh, but for slave soldiers, uh, not, uh, not, uh, not uh, the slave trade. Uh, uh, so th the relationship, the relationship between the north and the south, historically went back uh, in historical times before the advent of colonialism. But what colonialism did was uh, to keep to separate the, the, the two people, the north and the south, to keep uh, the south underdeveloped. So. At independence, they re really, the Southerners felt disadvantaged. In fact, before formal independence be happened in 1956, they revolted in, in the South in 1955 is when it started. 
So they had this fear of being dominated, of being marginalized. And uh, the Northern elite, as we discussed in our uh, previous uh, segment, uh, mismanaged uh, the nation building process. They, they, there was a failure of leadership there. Uh, the South felt always marginalized. It had grievances. And like you said, the uh, Nyanya movement, uh, civil war started uh, uh, from the, the beginning of independence. It continued up to 1972 when the Addis Ababa Peace Accord uh, brokered peace between uh, Khartoum and uh, the Nyanya rebels of the South. Uh, in fact, uh, John Garang, the leader, was a fighter in that first Anyanya movement uh, led under jo Joseph Lagu. Uh, he, uh, at that time, was sent for training to Israel as a young uh, rebel soldier. When, independent, when uh, the peace accord came in 1972, he was first uh, sent to Tanzania to study. He finished his high school in Tanzania. And from there, he, he did uh, his uh, undergraduate studies in the United States, in Iowa. So he got his bachelor's from the United States and then came back to continue his studies at uh, Dar es Salaam University uh, around the same time that Yowori Museveni of Uganda was studying there. They didn't know each other then, but uh, he, he went to this... Uh, quite influential uh, university of uh, Dar es Salaam. Uh, later, uh, Dr. John Garang uh, entered the Sudanese army. Like you said, he reached up to the rank of colonel. And uh, during the, the peace time, that is between 72 and 83, he was then sent to, to the United States. He did uh, undergo, underwent some military training at uh, Fort Bennings in Georgia. And he also did his master's study at Iowa University. Uh, his master's was in agricultural economy. And then he also continued his PhD at I Iowa University on developmental economics. So he's a, he's a very, very interesting, charismatic leader who had a broad knowledge. Uh, he, like Cabral, he, he studied agronomy, uh, he knew the importance of uh, development, of even development. Like you said, uh, his vision of, of New Sudan uh, was, uh, was very broad. It was not for uh, secession and uh, separatism of South Sudan. That was not his first option. And he won actually many uh, followers uh, in the North, uh, supporters. He, he had joined at one time his SPLA, SPLM, had joined the, the National Democratic Alliance opposition to, to the National Congress Party, to the Islamists of al-Bashir regime. Uh, many progressive democratic uh, politicians in the North uh, had high respect for him. And in his movement, there were uh, many Northerners like uh, Dr. Khalid Mansour, the late Dr. Khalid Mansour was his advisor and he, he was part of the SPLM. Yasser Arman, another uh, northern uh, politician, was uh, and st to this day is still part of the SPLM, the SPLM North. Uh, and so uh, many who are now in the borderlands, in uh, Nuba Mountains, in southern Kordofan, in what is now Upper Nile, these uh, borderland states, which are uh, part of the north now, but uh, which uh, felt marginalized, the same marginalization like uh, the Southerners had joined, uh, had joined his SPLM. And so, like you said, uh, his vision of New Sudan was uh, very broad. His first choice was uh, to unify Sudan free from, uh, from uh, sectarianism, from uh, uh, undue uh, influence of Arabism and uh, Islam. Uh, a multi-ethnic, multicultural, democratic Sudan that you know that embraced all all its elements. Uh, his uh, new Sudan vision, in sometimes he described it as Sudanism, as opposed to Arabism or Islamism or Black Africanism. He said, 
what I advocate is Sudanism, a Sudan that embraces all its citizens. Uh, in fact, after the signing of the peace accord uh, of Naivasha in 2005, when he came to visit Khartoum uh, in the early part of 2005, I forget, was it March or April 2005, uh, uh, an extremely huge crowd, some estimate uh, 2 million people, turned up to see him. They had... <laughs> high expectation of this charismatic leader, northerners, that is. Huh? In fact, another two million were coming from uh, cities like Atbara and Wad Madani and Kosti. But the regime, fearful of this, blocked all, all, all the roads. Otherwise, the, the crowd would have reached as, as, uh, as many as four million, I would estimate. And this squared uh, the Bashir regime quite quite. Uh, a lot. They were uh, extremely scared of this. They sensed that if elections were, uh, according to the Naivasha peace, uh, the CPA, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, uh, elections were to be held in 2010. And SPLM and Garang were going to enter that, uh, that national election for the whole Sudan. And there is no doubt that Garang would have won <laughs> hands down uh, the Islamists don't have really much following in the Sudan. Uh, they, they, they are a minority in many uh, free and fair elections. They never win. So uh, fearful of this, uh, you know, uh, there's always the question mark about that, uh, that helicopter crash that uh, killed him. Uh, and what would, have, uh, what would have happened had he survived? He was a very charismatic leader. He understood the problems of nation building, uh, deep intellectual with, uh, with a background in agriculture and developmental economics. He understood the issue of underdevelopment. Uh, I don't think rampant corruption would have happened under his leadership. Uh, he, he very early on understood that uh, 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 the underdevelopment in the, in the South uh, was deep in that uh, nation building process. There, there was no state to, to speak of. Huh? Uh, when, when the South became independent, de facto independent in 2005, but formally independent after the referendum in 2011, the, the institutions of state uh, were almost non existent, you could say. The, the, uh, or were uh, very, very limited. So the, the, the challenges of, uh, of long years of war, of uh, massive dis displacement, as you've said, of uh, destruction and the, the deaths of millions uh, during that, that long period of, of war, from uh, the first one from 1955 up to 1972, and the second one from 1983 up to 2005, that destruction and devastation was really, uh, you know, uh, not in favor of, of South Sudan when, be, when it became independent. By way of comparison, if I may, when Eritrea became a, a de facto independent in 1991, the economy was, of course, uh, devastated. Uh, the country was beginning from below zero, economically speaking. But the EPLF had developed uh, state institutions uh, during its uh, liberation war in, uh, in the liberated areas of Eritrea, in Sahel and the rest of Eritrea. Institutions of state were already developed. Huh? And also uh, Eritrea under Italian colonialism had uh, good uh, road uh, infrastructure, highway infrastructure connecting all parts of the country there were industries uh, and uh, agriculture and what have you. So uh, the state structure was uh, already existing there in, in South Sudan uh, that, uh, that was missing. So when uh, a referendum happened in 2011, of course, in the absence of uh, Dr. John Garang's leadership, uh, it was a foregone conclusion that the South Sudan would go would opt for, for independence. Also, the North, uh, there, there was no genuine uh, desire to, to keep Southern Sudan. Uh, there was 
the, the Bashir regime sort of pushed for secession or for separation of, of South Sudan. And so the new elite that emerged then, uh, there was a, a heavy scramble for uh, control of the state. Control of the state meant control of the oil revenues, huge oil uh, revenues, which were in South Sudan. Uh, although the pipeline went uh, via north through Port Sudan. And I think this exacerbated the internal uh, conflicts between uh, various uh, leaders, uh, Salva Kiir and uh, Riyak Mashar, but there were others also in, in the game. Uh, and, and this, I think, uh, to this day has not been fully resolved, although uh, currently there is a peace accord and some semblance of, uh, of uh, you know, stability returning still uh, uh, the concern is there that uh, uh, with only oil uh, as the main revenue uh, and other sectors of the economy neglected agriculture, uh, investment in infrastructure and what have you, uh, this kind of uh, the, the corruption uh, may deepen and further exacerbate the, the, the instability there. But uh, to continue the discussion, uh, also the, the peace accord that was signed uh, last week, uh, South Sudan itself uh, is brokering now, has brokered a uh, peace of the northern uh, uh, insurgencies, uh, the Sudan Revolutionary Front Coalition. Uh, Darfur uh, rebels and some southern uh, uh, SPLM factions have signed that, that accord. But still, there are other uh, two uh, major factions, the Sudan Liberation Movement under uh, Abdul Wahid uh, of the Darfur has not signed that, that peace agreement. The SPLM, SPLM North under the leadership of uh, Abdel Helu also has, has not signed it. Uh, it's hoped that they, they will they, they will later be uh, incorporated into this peace agreement, hopefully. Uh, but Southern Sudan itself now is becoming the broker of, of, uh, of peace accord, which, which in a way is a good hopeful sign. Uh, but there are always, uh, like you pointed out, involvement of external forces there uh, that makes one weary when uh, when you see the Qataris involved there. Uh, <laughs> that uh, that is a cause for concern. Uh, of course, other uh, regional uh, states like Ethiopia, Eritrea, Chad, and uh, Egypt uh, have also been involved in uh, in uh, in in this uh, in making this peace accord uh, possible. Uh, but we will see what what uh, what the future holds. But the main the main I think uh, issue that needs to be resolved now is the issue of corruption and the issue of uh, a fair share of in the, in the state power of all sectors of, of South Sudan. Like you said, uh, South Sudan is multi ethnic. There are uh, more than eighty ethnic groups. Uh, you mentioned the Dinka and the Nuer. Uh, these are not the only uh, the only ethnic groups. There are other. Uh, it's uh, it's it's, it's a, a co <laughs> it's a multi ethnic uh, mosaic there, and so the issue of nation building must be addressed seriously. Otherwise, the same problem that haunted uh, Khartoum, uh, South uh, North Sudan will continue to haunt uh, the South, in my opinion. But if you can continue uh, along this line. Uh. Uh, it is true that it is Southern Sudan. It is a, a multinational, multilinguist languages, uh, uh, two mode of production. You could say three. There are also merchants uh, in the northern part of Southern Sudan. Uh, traders and so, and so on, because the pastoralists of Southern Sudan, they were not traders. They are more interested in the market, of the cattle market, and they are uh, uh, <coughs> cattle producing communities. 
But there is uh, also, uh, after in the independence, on the eve of the independence, original segments who had played positive and negative uh, 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 relation with Southern Sudanese. The positive, of course, is uh, the view that they had on the old Sudan. Uh, uh, it shares also with the idea of General Garant. The new Sudan must be established on a new basis and gradually build their nation building and be integrated in the region as the most important economic uh, part of the region, the oldest region. It has a lot of cadres and so on and so on. And it will help also in the stabilization of the region of the Horn of Africa. And uh, uh, the advice of the Eritrean side is that one Sudan with diversity and unity and so on and so on, which is the same view as the Nual Garan. But uh, uh, the view of uh, uh, Wayani, of the TPLA, which was ruling Ethiopia, was, uh, to give you one example, is that it's not stability in Southern Sudan. In fact, it is to incite, as you have mentioned earlier, that it is the huge kingdom and the Shunkul kingdom, which is the Shunkul of Ethiopia. I remember the aristocracy of these Shunkul families, uh, uh, two of them, one he became an ambassador of Ethiopia in Yemen, Yusuf, another one, Abdurrahman. Very young, I knew them, and my father introduced me, and, and he is the one who taught me the history of that part of the country. And uh, they were extended in Addis Ababa area that is called Shogole Meda, Chunkul Meda. It is, it is uh, a lot of Ethiopians, they don't know the historical background and the relation. That region, it came to Ethiopia lately and changed so on with Anglo Abyssinian agreement and so on and so on, but Ethiopian agreement. But uh, 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 when this Southern uh, Sudan uh, agreement was signed in Napasha, uh, a new appetite developed also from the Kenyan side. The, those who played an uh, important role from, from Kenyan side uh, diplomacy, they were uh, the people from Napasha itself. But, uh, is a Kalanjini area, and the Kalanjini, uh, they are from the same closer to the people of the Southern Sudan. In, in a sense that they are uh, melodic, uh, both of them, to the Nuer and to the Dinkas. And the Kalanjinis played an important role in a sense that uh, with the Kenyan ruling class, they had assumed that the coming independence of Southern Sudan, there will be an access to Southern Sudan from Mombasa. So in another sense, it will strengthen the position of Kenya that it is it's not only Mombasa is providing to Kenya and to Uganda the utilities of Mombasa uh, port, but also it will provide all the goods and the services which is coming from the port of Mombasa. It will pass through Uganda and then to Duba, and Kenya will play an important role. So from that view, the Kenyans develop an appetite to say we will have, we will be assist at least a regional power, and they were designing their own uh, uh, vision. Uh, of course, entertaining Southern Sudanese, and there was a lot of Southern Sudanese refugees from uh, all types of Southern Sudanese families who were living in Kenya and so and so on. The view of Kenya is uh, the stability of Southern Sudan, yes, but it will strengthen Nairobi. It will strengthen Nairobi in the sense that it will strengthen Mombasa, and these two nations, Uganda and Southern Sudan, they will be connected to the line of uh, Kenya. Uh, uh, but they don't have, the, they never liked the idea of General Garan in a sense of, uh, uh, they consider it that he's pushing things to the north. Because the Kenyans also, they like the secession of Southern Sudan in order to integrate Southern Sudan with their own umbrella economy and with Mombasa Belt, what they call it the Mombasa Belt. And they didn't encourage the South Sudanese to see better because the relationship between Southern Sudan and the Northern Sudan is more deeper. You know, Three million Southern Sudanese, they live in the North. Uh, Arabic was a lingua franca and so on, it has integrated. 
lot of South Sudanese speak, traders are interconnected, psychological, despite of the conflict and so on, most of Sudanese feel Sudanese whether they are from the South and the North. So the basis of uh, building a new relationship among the Sudanese, whether it is the North or the South, it is there. And, and, and it had a long history within the Sudan. And this uh, note was understood uh, uh, in Kenya, and it is not also very much understood in, in, in Uganda. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Museveni himself, as General Garan, he had been in Tanzania and so on, he himself came from a very minority nationality, the Himas. He have no, of course, uh, ethnic concept as an idea, uh, he himself, in 70% minority, but it is, uh, uh, of course, he have defeated uh, the civil war in Uganda and have reestablished Uganda and so on, but he also saw Uganda uh, uh, role in southern Sudan as a bigger brother, he, a hegemonist, having an access to the sources of uh, Southern Sudanese. So both Kenya and Uganda, they have little bit local imperialist thinking. And of course, they didn't like that Sudanese Sudanese discussion to continue. And the view of General Garan is a bit totally different from their view. He is not against them. Sudan can have a relationship with Uganda, can have relationships with, and all of them are the uh, peoples of the Horn of Africa with a broader concept, we can have all the region together and build economic relations. The North also is part of Sudan, according to the general. But what I heard, I didn't uh, have any evidences that it is the helicopter crash, which was uh, given to, uh, to General Garan. They say that it is probably it is uh, uh, a device was implanted in the helicopter probably the Islamists of Sudan have paid for that. Uh, many played uh, as it plays everywhere, by the mind and heart of uh, weak people, it played a role and it is, became a fatal to Southern Sudan. I hope that it is uh, uh, the biography of General Garan will be rewritten, that the young generation can read it in the North and the South. Uh, you don't see a lot of people are uh, 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 really looking for that and who is General Garan? General Garan, the most important politician, whether he's in the south, in the north, he is about him is nothing spoken, there was no reporting in the imperialist media, nobody is talking about this. The buried of an African hero and uh, 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 and his vision was buried uh, uh, there that young people cannot read it. Uh, for this that it is, we are trying to bring the view, Southern Sudan is not only a war, Southern Sudan it produced uh, great leaders and visionary leaders like General Garan, and this must be known uh, and is the must uh, by all Sudanese whether they are North and South and all Africans, and particularly the people of Horn of Africa and the young people of Horn of Africa must read and try to make a research about him. Uh, the man was a multicultural, uh, a double vision, he have no uh, egoist sentiment for himself or for, for a small clique around him. But unfortunately, it is uh, uh, probably, I think, he didn't have the proper protection and uh, he was eliminated. Uh, South Sudanese now have to go back and after this agreement have to think very deep and have to win the trust of their own population particularly the political group who have signed, and they have to be honest and serious that it is, uh, they must establish a commission for the embezzlement happened after the Fasha agreement, who stole, who is responsible for all that, while South Sudanese are suffering and so mm -hmm. that, that indeed, uh, that corruption, uh, corruption has been haunting it uh, since 2005. Uh, the amount of money reached, some say, to the tune of uh, 20 billion uh, revenue from oil that uh, has just uh, has just been vanished. Uh, at one time, in the state's uh, budget, 
something like two billion dollars disappeared. Nobody could uh, account for it. This was a, a big scandal just in the beginning of uh, of uh, independence. So that I think uh, is uh, oil has been uh, a curse instead of blessing. Just uh, just uh, to to some extent as it as it has been in Angola, let's say, or Nigeria. The oil curse is, uh, it could have uh, fueled the development projects, uh, contributed tremendously towards uh, nation building, uh, education, health services, and what have you. I mean, 20 billion is, uh, is a lot of money. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, corruption has, has, uh, has been haunting it. Uh, and uh, unless this is addressed uh, by young uh, revolutionary, uh, you know, leaders, uh, it will remain to be quite problematic for for that country, uh, and will fuel may fuel uh, for further civil war uh, because this the civil war actually started. Uh, even during the time of, of John Garang, uh, in the 1990s, there was a, a bloody civil war within the SPLM, uh, factional split of uh, Riyak Mashar, uh, Lama Kol, and others in what became known as SPLM Nasser group, uh, which later also yes, another split of SPLM United. And this bloody uh, civil war, uh, the massacre that happened there was quite, uh, quite horrendous. But uh, to his credit, uh, Dr. John Garang managed to, to contain that. And even when uh, people like Reak Mashar and Lama Kol went and defected to the Khartoum regime and uh, were used there and used and thrown, they, they went they came back to to the SPLM again, uh, and he, uh, in, in a wise uh, statesmanship, uh, embraced them back to the fold uh, to strengthen the the national unity. Uh, some didn't like it. Uh, some didn't like the the coming back of uh, Riyak Mashar, for example. Uh, but uh, this was the kind of uh, visionary leadership that. Uh, that Dr. John Garang had, and uh, his, uh, you know, his stature in the international arena, in the international geopolitics, uh, like you've pointed out, was uh, far wide and respected in, in the African scene, in Europe, in the United States. Uh, he was quite the statesman, and I think uh, his uh, early uh, removal from the scene in that uh, tragic helicopter crash of 2005 uh, played uh, against uh, South Sudan. Uh, had he had he stayed, had he been there, uh, he would have. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that uh, uh, a lot of the tragedy could have been averted in what we saw in, in South Sudan. So the issue of corruption. Uh, and uh, what is to be done with oil and oil revenue uh, has to be addressed if South Sudan is to to stabilize and move forward. Uh, one element which we didn't mention is that it is uh, those who are uh, traders uh, and benefit from the conflict of their neighbors is uh, the people that did. Uh, the conflict vultures of our region, you're right. Our region is the TPLF. The TPLF also uh, uh, first supported uh, Rick Mashar, later on uh, using the umbrella of African Union, the so-called South-South negotiation, that it is the one who is responsible to bring them on the table and to, be go, to go between them. It was C.U. Maston. I was told when I was in Addis Ababa, C.U. Maston was earning uh, every day $1,000 uh, 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 per hour on the affair of Southern Sudan, which is means that it is, uh, he was the broker and he's no, he was not interested also for the, knowing his narrow thinking and narrow thinking of the TPLF. 
They wanted to capitalize with the situation in southern Sudan and make money out of it. And they were not interested, uh, and they don't even interested on the stability of the Sudan and so on. This is why. Second, because of their strong alliance and dependence with the Sudanese intelligence and with the Islamists and so on. When, when you go deeper, uh, uh, the TPLA view of southern Sudan is connected to the Sana'a group, which it is al-Bashir and Zenawi and uh, Ali Abdullah Salah, which they have signed to quarantine Eritrea, uh, and so and so on. And they see that this PLA, particularly the Sudanese opposition, which have been stationed in Eritrea as uh, enemy, uh, uh, according to the TPLA. Mm -hmm. This southern Sudanese problem also indirectly TPLA intelligence and TPLA warlord armies sometimes supporting one group against the other group by dressing them as if they are aware of Ethiopia or or and so and so on. Now the situation which helped southern Sudanese that element is no more there quarantined in Tigray and is fighting for it his life, he's living with life support machine. So uh, this is also is a positive development for Southern Sudan because Southern Sudan had been in the Ethiopian foreign policy, it is just an, as an stick to use and to weaken Sudan in general, but it is not to weaken Sudan in a sense is that that it is to make sure that to have a leverage on, on, on a bargaining chip, a bargaining chip against uh, uh, their problem are facing with the Eritrea revolution in Eritrea and other places, and, and under the Wayani, of course, it is a bargaining chip and making money. Secondly, of course, uh, they wanted to dominate Juba and the economy in Juba because it is, as you have said, the human resources was very very thin in southern Sudan, with the new wells was discovered, so that it is a certain Tigrayan uh, uh, so-called business people, but they are not business people, they are quick fixers, who went to southern Sudan to provide, for example, to, 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 to provide beers like uh, General Tzadkan, he had established his, uh, his contact there, and his beer was going over there before he sold it, and so on, other Tigrayan business people, they thought is an extension of their economy until, until southern Sudan. So from that perspective mm -hmm. also, they just want to weak southern Sudan, no unification among the Sudanese and so and so on. They only look from the narrow sectarian economic interest. But I wish the southern Sudanese and the northern Sudanese come to their sense and a minimum understanding among themselves, because the link between them is much stronger than the link between other nations of their neighbors. Uh, whether it is economically, psychologically, uh, the number of the South Sudanese who live in the north is more than 3 million. Even in Egypt, there were a lot of South Sudanese are living there, and this and this. Mm -hmm. Psychology is more connected. So they have a very long historical economic relation, which is negative and positive to an extent. And the positive is that interlinked, the negative is it was used uh, in the interest of one small group in Khartoum. But now is the South, it is sovereign and it has its own resources. It has to think uh, properly to choose its partners in the region. And uh, the first thing, of course, they have to clean up their homes and uh, their houses and uh, establish their institutions and uh, integrate everybody in southern Sudan on an equal basis, and then try to deal with the region as, in, as brothers and sisters to build a new region which is safe for them and safe to, for everybody. This is what Correct. I would advise. Of course, now uh, there are uh, positive elements. Uh, uh, the regime in Ethiopia, which was basically anti-region, and it had been uh, 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 a servant to external forces through remote control and destabilizing the region is no more there. Uh, uh, at least their active role it doesn't exist. It is marginalized and quarantined in a very small area. Uh, this will be an advantage that Southern Sudanese have to think very much and use this situation now and uh, deal. The regime in the north have collapsed. And there is now a transitional government uh, which is uh, still not yet uh, 
clear what will come out of it, but it is the war it has ended. Uh, now the mm -hmm. South Sudanese are also involved with uh, and uh, helping other forces in the north of coming to terms with the transitional government, which is, I consider, positive. This shows that the link between the north and the south, how deep is. And yes. uh, the southerns, they have no any antagonism toward the north, and the reverse also is the same. And those who are merchants of contradictions, so they have disappeared. You're, qu you're uh, quite right there. The, the linkage uh, uh, between north and south is not going to go away. It is deep, like you said. Uh, also, uh, South Sudan, I think uh, you will agree with me, can play a bridge uh, between East African economic community, because it's a member of the East African economic community, which includes a big market, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, uh, Uganda, Rwanda, I think Burundi is also there. So. Uh, this is on the one hand. On the other hand, it's linkage with uh, the Nile Basin, with uh, North, with Sudan, and Egypt is, is there, with Ethiopia, with the Horn of African countries. So it can play uh, the role of a bridge, uh, which uh, in an ideal uh, setting of peace and stability uh, will bring development uh, to that country. Like you said, oil should not be the only focus, uh, South Sudan is rich, uh, as a uh, good land. Uh, it's, uh, you know, in uh, cattle, goats and sheep, this uh, animal husbandry is quite big. So it, uh, it can, uh, you know, have an export market towards the Middle East in that regard. Agriculture, agricultural potential is huge. Of course, the infrastructure of, of that country is still uh, still uh, severely limited and underdeveloped. Uh, all that uh, oil wealth, if it had been used properly, could have connected uh, all the parts of the country and enhanced nation building. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Uh, plus, uh, I think the, the external great power interference has also played a role, uh, I don't know how you see that China and the United States vying for, uh, for control uh, of resources in that country, uh, whether it has contributed to stability or uh, exacerbated the, the current instability uh, is an issue that I'm not, uh, I'm not quite sure of. Uh, uh, currently, the pipeline, oil pipeline goes through the north. Uh, but there was another option also uh, to build a pipeline that goes through southern Ethiopia and all the way to Mombasa or the new port that they were planning to build in Lamo. Uh, I think the Chinese uh, may have been hoping to get that, uh, that contract, but... Uh, so far, it's just, uh, it's just been a dream that uh, has not been implemented. So the only uh, access for, uh, for that oil to the external market is through the pipeline of, uh, that goes to Port Sudan. Uh, but in the future, as you said, uh, South Sudan being a landlocked country, it can use both the Port Sudan uh, route even Eritrean ports, uh, Masawa and Asab, can be used uh, for, it, uh, for it to access, and Mombasa as well. Uh, it, it, its options must be, must be wide. Because I remember uh, a few years ago, uh, the port of Masawa was used uh, for uh, relief aid for Southern Sudan when the civil war was raging. Uh, certain parts of, uh, of South Sudan that were quite uh, near the border of the north, uh, it was easier to, to reach them, to access them from Masawa. And so relief aid uh, uh, from Masawa through Kasala all the way to South Sudan was, was, uh, was uh, made accessible. That shows you that uh, Eritrean ports also could be used for, for Southern Sudan, if there is peace and stability. It all boils down, we have to have 
broad regional peace and stability in, uh, in the greater Horn of Africa. So with that, I, I, uh, I think uh, we are reaching uh, the end of our uh, segment and I will give you by way of, uh, of uh, making concluding remarks uh, to, to wrap up and then to, to prepare us for uh, the next uh, uh, discussion, which will be in, uh, on Sudan, uh, the North Sudan that is, uh, and, and then uh, we'll see elsewhere also. Thank you, Comrade Elias. It is uh, our main uh, objective is that it is uh, to broaden the horizon of our uh, followers from the Horn of Africa and beyond. Uh, such kind of discussions uh, uh, doesn't exist uh, uh, in most of part of the region uh, because of uh, lack of information lack of understanding of regional concept. We in the Horn of Africa the group, we believe that it is the Horn of Africa, uh, uh, it is one entity interlinked dialectically, and it is interlinked also with other entities like the Red Sea Basin, the Nile uh, uh, region, and, and so on, in a greater sense of it, even the, to Eastern African economic relations. So all so a new Horn of Africa vision. Horn of Africa vision. And that's why we bring the countries to countries, region to the regions that people can understand and we give a, a, an information. Uh, uh, in a formation, a sense, our young people can make research whether they are inside the country or in diaspora. Uh, one thing is uh, our ports, we have never utilized them properly for the growth of our region. Ports in the past used by the colonial powers to export what they want, what is looted from these people and bring it to the port and transport it to them to where they want and they make money out of it and wealth out of it. But our port, it is, it is one of the most important organ, integrates also the region. And, 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 and it increases the wealth inside of the country and in the region. So the concept of the port, we must have a very democratic, a wide concept. Uh, in 1952, as far as port concerned, the United States made a very good study, uh, which they cost them that it is a million and a half dollar about Ethiopia, which port have to utilize. And this is a very scientific study. It exists in the copy of it and the original one in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ethiopia. And the study says is as follows. For Ethiopian regions, particularly the northern part, which is means big northern Wolo, uh, Gojam, even Wallaga, which is the old provinces, Gondar, Tigray, all this area, including Eritrea, the nearest and cost benefit harbor is Masai which is by study on it, it is also the nearest port to southern Sudan, Juba is Masawa. That's a fact. Uh, Asab is for the center. The second one is comparing, the study is comparing between Masawa and Kismayo. These two are the, the most nearest, whether for southern Ethiopia, the nearest is Kismayo, and for southern Sudan and for Sudan, and even for Uganda, the nearest is Kismayo rather than in Bobasa. Mombasa was created from the British interest point of view. It's not from the Africans' interest. After they conquered and they defeated the Bagandas and they created Uganda out of it, and they, they took over Kenya and they wanted to transport the looted things through Mombasa because Mombasa, historically, it was a port of the Swahili port under the Oman domination. So we want is that now Mombasa also have an important role to play uh, things to uh, southern Sudan, also to, to, to Uganda, to Burundi, to Rwanda, and so on. Now, in the 21st century, ports have a multiple role to play in the dynamic of economics. One time, we will organize the program about the different ports on the Horn of Africa. And ports are becoming very, very important. The second point we would like also, by discussing about ourselves, 
we would like also to horizon our, our views and our listeners that there is a fundamental change in the world situation and economic situation, which Comrade Elias, he mentioned that the Chinese involvement. Today, United States thinks that it is a U.S. policy is to try to minimize the Chinese influence in the African continent because Chinese influence is increasing in Africa according to them. And the involvement of Chinese are becoming very, very big in the region. Therefore, we have to do something about it and that they are adjusting. When we look at the demographical sense of it, yes, China and India, both of them, they are 40% of world population. When we add the Asian countries and Japan uh, and, and, and European Union and uh, uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, about 80% of world population live in this region, which is means Africa have 10% and the two America, North and South have 10%. The 80% is live in this huge area. And the biggest economy in the world is in this area. And this area today, it is interconnected to three rivers and one small ocean, which is called the Indian Ocean. The river are the Mediterranean, the Caspian Sea, four rivers, the Hormuz and the Red Sea. We are also part of this bigger part of the, the world situation. So next time uh, we will organize uh, me and comrade uh, Elias and we'll invite other people. The new view of United States on Africa and the view of China on African continent and how we Africans see ourselves in this big two globe, uh, uh, big powers uh, reasoning uh, and what Africans and particularly the Horn of Africa, how we have to adjust ourselves. We will discuss uh, this in one of the following discussion groups uh, of us. But before we go to that and after we do one more uh, time on uh, on uh, uh, Sudan, then we will go to our brothers and sisters who are now in a difficult situation in on Yemen, because we would like also our people to know in our region, whether our people in Yemen, uh, our Yemenese brothers and sisters, which are, I consider them part of the Horn of Africa and the Red Sea region, that we will discuss about Yemen and where it is going, what happened to Yemen, what was the view of Yemenis, and so on, me and Elias, and if we can bring other people together, we will make uh, one uh, long uh, uh, program. And then we will uh, uh, go to uh, the region and the world, which I mentioned, what is Chinese interest in the region, and what is the interest of the United States in the region, and what we have to do about it, and how can we, national interest of the region, can be defended without offending anybody in the region. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Comrade Elias, for your knowledge of Sudan. And uh, next week, uh, Monday, we will come back and uh, we will uh, continue on Sudan. Uh, next week also, I will make a, 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 a resume of, of the three programs me and Comrade Elias we made on Ethiopia and also on, on Sudan, the three, which is after the, uh, the third one we do in Amharic for our, for our Ethiopian uh, uh, brothers and sisters to follow it. Uh, I will uh, narrate it uh, and, and we give information. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, Clarek, uh, our comrade, who is uh, the technical man on this issue, and I will thank everybody uh, 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 very much and I, I wish you uh, best time and uh, the struggle will continue and thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Comrade Mohammed Hassan. Uh, this was a very good discussion uh, on South Sudan. We may not have done it justice, but we hope our viewers uh, were able to get uh, a sense of uh, how things are on the ground, the background history, context, and uh, some of the critical issues that face that young nation. We wish it very well. We wish it uh, peace and stability as it moves forward uh, and uh, for it to play a proper ro role as a bridge uh, connecting the Horn of Africa and East African region. 
uh, with that, dear viewers, we have come to the conclusion of uh, our discussion on South Sudan, the Horn of Africa, and beyond. Next week will be Sudan again, and the northern part that is. Uh, until next time, salam. Mm -hmm.